You are listening to the Fresh Take Network, SIF interview exclusive. Welcome to Fresh Take, everyone. We are very, very pleased to have today Robbie Hart from the fantastic documentary Icebreakers about the 1972 summit series between the Soviet Union and Team Canada. Robbie, thank you so much for coming on. This was a fantastic documentary and it's an absolute privilege to have you on talking about today. Excellent, Josh. It's it's really cool to be on on the air with you and on Fresh Take. And uh, I actually wanted to do a Fresh Take on 72 with Icebreaker. Oh yeah. And uh, treat treat the subject, uh, you know, in an original and sort of untold way which is really what, what I set out to do and I think what I've accomplished. I think you really did. I think for my generation, uh, you know, and I'm in my mid thirties and I think a lot of people still knew about the Paul Henderson call, right? It was everywhere, right? We have coins about Paul Henderson. We've heard that call everywhere. You go to the hall of fame, you see the picture. I don't think any of that stuff is unknown. I don't think a lot of people know the full story. Believe it or not, I think a lot of people know about that goal. Some people probably don't know it. There's 34 seconds left on the clock. They don't know everything that was going into that, the political landscape. I'm sure they have an idea of. But you guys did such a good job of breaking this down. And the one thing I really appreciated about on this is it wasn't just so pro Canada, rah rah Canada. It was showing the Soviet side as well and everything the Soviets had to build up, but also showing how much it meant to Canada to win the game. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. Um, You know, it's funny. It begins for me like two years ago. I pick up a book in Montreal on, on a street corner, a pile of books, and, and they were for free. So it says, take me home type of thing. And I look at the pile of books, and there was one of them that has this photo of Phil Esposito looking face-to-face, nose-to-nose with a Soviet, uh, a Soviet hockey player. The title of the book is The Cold War. It was written by uh, Roy McSkimming out of Perth, Ontario in 98 for the 25th anniversary. And um, I pick up the book. And of course, you know, I know it's I know it's 72 and I start reading 20 pages in. I realize I don't really know that much about what took place. And I, I am a Canadian history buff and uh, hockey, you know, aficionado. So I know a lot. And yet I realized I knew very little. And the more I went deeper into the book, the more I realized that there's all these other layers to the stories, the political layer, the fans who went over, you know, the, the fact that the team really wasn't a team that they had never played together, how the Russians impacted us on that game one. And the deeper I went in, I said, I read, this is a story that has to be told. People just know the superficial. And then I started talking to other people who are much younger, and, uh, including my kids and others. And they don't even know about Paul Henderson. I mean, they don't even know what happened. So I realized it was this generation gap, like this big chunk of our history, seminal moment, not not really shared. So my, my, my motivation was in place to, to do a, a story that really brings to life 72 on the 50th anniversary, no less. And, um, you know, tells the untold story and also gives us the excitement of those eight hockey games, especially game one and game eight. Yeah, I think you did a really good job of making the viewer feel like they're at those games. And as you talked about too, there's so, so much history that wasn't realized. Like for me, I did not realize how the international game, Canada just kind of wasn't a part of it because of just thinking they were so much better. That was something I had no idea about. Yeah, well, it wasn't so much that they were better. It's that they, that they were professionals. Yeah. And, and the International Ice Hockey Federation would only let Canada send, you know, university players or, uh, you know, semi-pro guys. So we stopped sending teams because we said, we're going to play when we can send our best. And it was like a double double standard. I mean, the Soviets were, were, were so-called amateurs, but not really amateurs because they were being paid by the, by the government and the Central Red Army, and they were completely a, 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 12, a 12-month, you know, a full-time job, basically, uh, you know, playing and preparing for hockey. And it's only until all the negotiations that took place, and really, it, it's all about the Cold War and, and how, how um, you know, Trudeau mandated the, the Canadian diplomats to... To, to foster detente with the Soviets, and they call it the hockey bridge. And, and hockey was the way to break break down the thaw. It was the icebreaker. That's why the film is called the icebreaker. I mean, there's about four levels of icebreaking in in my documentary, and one is on the political level for sure. 
it's almost like Canada's Rocky four in some ways of just breaking down the barriers and even kind of learning about the embassy games that were going on and, and kind of the small ice breaking side of that, that could have been a whole documentary in itself. I was oh, yeah, that, that so interested in that. Yeah. Gary Smith, the diplomat, uh, uh, every Saturday with a, with a case of Molson Canadian uh, and going out and playing against the, the Soviet uh, the Soviet bureaucrats, if you like, kind of, for a shinny game. It's great, great footage in the film. I mean, uh, great yeah. archives. Yeah, tremendous. It really was. So was the, was the book then, you were talking about that book, was so that was the main influence to be like, I need to get this into a documentary form to tell the greater story? Yeah, that, that was the trigger. I mean, that was the trigger that got my head going, oh my God, there's a story here that hasn't been told. And the 50th anniversary is coming up in two years. You know, and the next step for me was to call another producer friend of mine out in Toronto, Peter Raymond, who uh, owns and runs uh, White Pine Pictures. They're like a, a, you know, a solid outfit. And I knew he has a lot of contacts. And since, since it's such a big story, I felt maybe if it was a, a co-production Quebec, Ontario, uh, we'd be able to... Uh, you know, pull together more resources, raise more funding. Uh, I would be the director and the co-producer. He would be the co-producer. And that's exactly what happened. And the next day, we're talking about within a week of having picked up that book, I'm already like connected to Peter Raymond. He says, I'm in, let's team up. And then he connects me to Roy McGregor, who's a famed uh, political author. I'm not sure if you know who he is, but Roy McGregor is considered the Wayne Gretzky of Canadian hockey writing. He's done books and written a ton of articles. And oh, yeah, Wayne... Definitely. Uh, excuse me, Roy says, uh, Robbie, you've got to meet Gary Smith. He's preparing a book, which has just been released, called The Ice War Diplomat. Gary was in the embassy in Moscow in 71, 72. He's your man. Connect with Gary. So within another week, there's me, Roy, Gary, and Peter all, all together on a Zoom, and we're, we're, we're talking about Icebreaker. And, and so that was the genesis of the project. From there, I started reading Gary's book. Uh, which was only in a manuscript form. It wasn't ready even printed. And um, again, going deeper into the, story, the untold stories. And uh, I, I said, this is, this is fantastic. And then, of course, Gary becomes a character in the film. We go to Moscow together. Uh, he's got all the contacts. 50 years later, he hadn't been there. Uh, so it was like, you know, it just the whole story comes together. And what you were mentioning before about the Russians, I mean, you know, Gary... Gary had the contact with the Canadian embassy. The Canadian embassy reached out to the Russian Hockey Federation, of which Trechak is the president. And within, within weeks, not even, I'd say a couple of weeks max, of him hearing about a Montreal crew wanting to come to the Soviet, to Russia, to Moscow, to do a documentary on the 50th, he gave it a green light. And that opened all the doors for us to go that way. And I really wanted the Russian perspective to be told. And Mikhailov is in the film, Yakushev and, and Trechak, they were all on the 72 team. And I also got uh, Igor Larionov, who was 12 years old, kind of like my Gretzky uh, counterpart. Yeah. Gretzky was 12 at the time. So it's, it's from the eyes of a 12 year old, what he remembers, of course, plus being a professional NHL hockey player, but a Russian. So you have two, two a Canadian uh, NHL a superstar, Gretzky, and a Russian superstar, uh, Larionov, who were younger at the time, 12 and how it impacted them. Plus you have the three legends uh, that participated in the, in, in the uh, 72 series. Yeah, I think it was, it was so crucial too to, number one, going to Moscow and getting to see that arena, I thought was so fantastic. Just mm -hmm. to, especially when he says like, it's the same, but then you, cause yeah, you always exactly. get these, these feelings conjured up of those arenas, right? And there's always this romanticizing of being in these old arenas and spots and you could really feel that but you could you know you can tell sometimes like if these arenas could talk but as you guys were going through you could kind of feel the history and just kind of looking at the seats and everything the camera work on that was just fantastic yeah well that, that's that's the director telling yeah, having yeah. the vision of how as soon as i saw that place i said oh my god this is like a, a sunken ship that's been drawn up 50 years ago like an old titanic Nothing's, nothing's changed. And, it, it, you know, I really organized the shoot in front in, to do exactly what, what you're saying. And I'm really pleased that you sense that because, you know, I, I, I had them open those lights, you know, boom, boom, boom down the hallway. You know, the marble floors from the Stalinist era, the chandeliers, uh, all the details of the close-up shots of the seats and the rows and stuff like that, the old brick, 
and it was you know really like this this antique sh shop that had just been frozen in time and when you think about it Luzniki uh, ice palace or sports palace of sports it's called Luzniki palace of sports hosted 50 percent of the summit series four of the eight games were played in that in that ring yeah. you know one was played at the montreal forum another one at maple leaf gardens one at the winnipeg arena and one at the vancouver coliseum so when you think about it that place really has the whole, the ghosts and the energy and the karma of 72 and when i went in there i felt it it was yeah. like unbelievable yeah and i really wanted to to capture that moment and and, and then bring it to film, you know what I mean? And, and, and tell the story that way. Just like I had, you know, what, uh, yep, Trechak exit the, uh, the hall, yeah. you know, where the players would come out and you hear fans screaming, of course, it's all empty, but it looks, and he's raising his hands. And he was like almost playing for me, you know what I mean? And then to be, or acting for, for the film in a certain way, you know? I mean, I asked him to do it and he did it. And then, you know, he spoke in English and broke in English. It was so that English was so fantastic. Dramatic. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, he he, he re-dramatizes, reenacts the last minute, the Henderson goal. I mean, right in the same spot where it was where it actually took place. He's standing in the crease. <laughs> I mean, there's no net on the ice at this point when we do it. And, and, but I mean, it's it's it was goosebumps. And and uh, for a documentary filmmaker, you know that when that's happening, you've got the golden moment. Yeah, it was so magical with you talked about him reenacting it. And I kind of felt those goosebumps as too as a viewer too of this guy's reacting, arguably, you know, maybe a new generation would say the Crosby goal, but I think most Canadian historians would say the Henderson goal, the most famous goal in the history of Canadian hockey. And here's the Soviet that's reenacting everything and even breaking down the broken play of it. I was like, if that didn't happen, he kind of just has like, but if, 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 if this doesn't happen maybe you know we have the chance to tie it and we technically win the series that part was just so beautiful of him breaking it down and then even like you were saying breaking down the motions of everything he had as the keeper yeah yeah no exactly and he says Vasilia, his defenseman big mistake yeah <laughs> you know, he, he, and he, you know cornway good pass and he does break down the last minute and uh it, it really is quite something and you know he, he also says that it was the greatest hockey he ever played. It was the greatest. Yeah. It can never be repeated that what happened in 72 was the trigger. I mean, it was the launching pad for international hockey. Best versus best. Yeah. We're not talking about best versus worst. Or, you know, when we send teams to the world championships, it's like, not, you know, it's the teams that are eliminated for players that are the scraps left over from the Stanley Cup playoffs or not making the Stanley Cup playoffs. So, you know, Canada Cup, Olympics, best on best. 72 was the launching pad for all of that. And it, it feels so special and it feels like it's a mark that, you know, when they talk about the miracle on ice, it's really forgotten. And then obviously the Americans at times tell their own stories with things, but it, you kind of just look at the launch of that's the real game that really launches the international hockey, the, the cold war side of the hockey, seeing the Soviets, right? Because for a large audience, they had never seen what the Soviets had even been like. You know, you get to the Miracle on Ice, for example, you don't have as much of a buildup to the Soviets other than just having that cold war side. Now you've seen them in the Summit Series and then obviously expanded since then. And you get an idea, like you talked about, of the puck movement, of the speed, of the grace, the butterfly effect and the goaltending that really wasn't seen. You get all this broken down that you just hadn't seen from the Soviet team before. Yeah, no, no, that's what, there, as I was telling you, there's four levels of ice breaking or yeah. icebreaker in, in the doc. The first one we were talking about is using, you know, a hockey uh, as a political, you know, uh, detente method mandated by Trudeau to, to get closer to the Soviets create exchanges and uh, create a dialogue with them on the political level and use hockey. You know, the second level is, is how the game was transformed. I mean, it was an icebreaker for, for the game itself. And I often tell people now that, you know, in screenings, you know, how do you feel about Canada winning? Well, I say, you know, it's not really, the big winner was not Canada nor the Soviet Union. The big winner was the game of hockey itself. Hockey went up a whole level when the Soviets came to Canada and when we went to Moscow uh, in 72. The game was transformed and you, you're giving us the, 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 some of the examples just before. Five man units, puck possession, conditioning all year, the pause, like holding onto the puck and like waiting for the right time, not just slapping it and looking for a rebound, you know what I mean? Dumping it in, making the passes, 
going back, circling, all these things which are part of the, you know, hockey today, the Soviets were doing that back in 72. And so it was an eye opener for, for us. Uh, in, 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 it really like opened up everybody's eyes to how the game can be played. And then you have, right after that, the Finns and the Swedes coming into the NHL, you know, at, and learning from them too. And then the Czechs and the Slovaks, it was Czechoslovakia coming in and then the Russians started coming. So it's like hockey went from being, the NHL went, which was still the greatest hockey league in the world, went from being 90% Canadian to an international league where the best of the best are played. And so hockey is the big winner from 72. And the game went from here to another level. Uh, and uh, I really wanted that to, to be um, part of the story. And it, it's, it's, it's wonderful how it's told uh, and how it's shared and what they learned from us too. And our resilience, our never giving up, our grit, uh, you know, the toughness of our play. So there, there's this kind of like uh, metissage, uh, this mixing, you know, of, of uh, the North American style of hockey and what the Russians were doing. And 72 is the, is the, the legacy of that. It's the, um, the cradle of where hockey, you know, had a reboot, if you like. Yeah, and you mentioned too, like the the work ethic too is so different. Of you talked about the the Canadian players, like they don't really get into shape until the like midway into the season. Whereas the Soviets are work, 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 and now you see that nowadays, if someone doesn't go to an OTA in football or doesn't start practicing hockey in like July, fans are dogging them. Back then, it's like yeah, we're into shape at the time. That's just what it is. Well, a lot of those guys, you know, they were running softball leagues or they were yeah. they had second jobs. They had some of them mm -hmm. would go back to the farm. I mean, they were drinking beer right up to September, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, or they were car salesmen or they were, they were reps for breweries, you know, and a lot of them had, you know, second jobs, uh, you know, and look at the salaries in, in the 1970s. I mean, for a lot of those guys, it, it wasn't enough uh, to, to make ends meet. So they'd come to camp and they'd only get really going by the time you hit January, you know, uh, so, uh, October, November, we're kind of like almost getting into shape months. Uh, today, it's unheard of. You're, you're in shape year round, basically. Have to be, yeah. And, yeah. and the, and the so Soviets were. So it took it took Team Canada at least five weeks. You know, they got off to a, a slow start. Yeah. Uh, and it really, until they hit Moscow, where they realized, look, okay, we've got to pick up our game here. These, you know, we've got to go all in, all out. And and it it, it, it's, it took time. It took time, and Gretzky explains it beautifully in the film. He did. You know, not just about being in shape, but you, you can't just put guys together in a room and say, be a team, yeah. you know? And a lot of those guys hated each other. You know, the Canadians just won the Stanley Cup against the Bruins. Uh, you know, those guys are hockey wars. Now suddenly they're, they're in the same locker room, you know, being told to be a team. And there had never been a team Canada of the best. So this was like a novel experience. Esposito in the same room with Savard and Cornway and Dryden, I mean, it had never been done. So it's, 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 uh, it's really, 72 is really a radical uh, experiment in a certain way. And it took the team some time to actually gel and to find harmony. And then there were too many guys. So some guys had to get cut and other guys weren't playing enough. And so until they actually got their core group of 20, yeah. did they really become, okay, this is the team, we're all in and um, let's start rowing together. And that's, yeah, what, I, that's I, what happened. I found that part of the Gretzky so, so interesting because it kind of clicked. It's like, of course. And we've seen that so many times in the past, you know, with, you know, super teams together. It's like, hey, it doesn't work because sometimes they don't gel and sometimes they hate each other. And for example, for 72, right? Like you said, like Canadians had just won the cup and they're not meshing with Bruins and all that stuff. And it, it, the interesting part too is you kind of look at a deep dive of, the what ifs from both sides right like the canadians mm -hmm. are like well we didn't have bobby Orr and we didn't have hall and then obviously there were some big russian players that didn't play as well either so that's such an interesting what if what if some of those guys would have played would they yeah. have been suited to to the to the team or did they find the right gel when they got to to the summit series yeah no or what if clark had never slashed harlemont i mean yeah, yeah. There, there, there's a few what ifs out there i mean on both sides of the table you know what I mean? And we, we probably, arguably, didn't have the best hockey player in the world in Bobby Orr. And, um, you know, we didn't have Bobby Hull. But it is what it is. They, they have their what-ifs and we have our what-ifs. Yeah. 
You know, and then better. there's what if the, the 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 refereeing was better, or what if yeah. this or what if that. So there's you know you got to you got those are like disclaimers that like cross each other out, you know, in a sense on both sides of the fence. And uh, the big winner was hockey. I mean, yeah, we, we we pulled off a miracle, but I mean, the big winner was hockey. I loved that you t- you talked about showcasing off the games. Game one was showcased off so perfectly. And I just, just from the intro, right, of the Canadian players, rah, rah, all the cheers. And then these poor Soviets come out and there's no, no applause for them whatsoever. It, the, the dignitaries are kind of giving them a little clap. And I think at that point, you know, you could tell from the way the Soviets were talking there. I was like, okay, it's us against them. We understand it. So let's get going and let's showcase up what's going. And obviously in that game one, they showed like, hey, we're not here to mess around. We know you think that Canada hockey is the best, but we're not too bad ourselves. No, exactly. And that, you know, by then the audience is like, cause I've already done like public screenings. The audience is starting to like get into the humor of it. Like when yeah. Treche goes, we only got two claps, one, two from the, from yeah. the embassy bureaucrats, people in, in the audience, like they crack up. I mean, there's a, there's a roar. And, and like, I know now having done all these theatrical screenings, when you're in a room with 200 people, you, you see the, uh, the emotion rising in the room, you know, you can feel it. Uh, and it, it really starts to pick up right around game one, which which is around the 12 minute mark of the film before the puck is dropped. You know, you have the Esposito moment where he he, he wins, he, he aggressively wins the, uh, you know, the ceremonial puck drop. Yeah. Who does that, right? I mean, you're supposed yeah. to pick up the puck and give it back to, to Trudeau, but he, he knocks it out of his hands practically, you know? So, so you see all this stuff and then you've got Terry Mosher, unbelievable political cartoonist, you know, with all his drawings. Great addition Master- to the documentary. Great addition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great addition to the film, and it's a, Terry's an amazing guy, and he he has a book called From Montreal to Moscow, and he's he appears at a lot of the screenings with me uh, and with Terry uh, on stage. We do uh, with Gary, so we're doing this uh, this the Q and A's together in some places when it's possible, and uh, his drawings are just fantastic. And you know, he's he enters the film right around there, like. Canadians score one goal, then they score two goals. Everybody thinks it's going to be 4,000 goals to one, he mm-hmm. says, you know, and uh, this is going to be easy. Like all the predictions were, were accurate. And then before you know it, the tide turns and, and it's 2-2 after the first period. And then we know the rest. The Soviets just run, around, run away with that game. Team Canada was not in shape to keep up with them. And before you knew it, it was 7-3. to three. And it was a shocker. It was, it was, it was, you know, Brian Conacher, when he said that to me in the interview, this line, and it's in the film. He goes, on September the 2nd, 1972, that night, hockey changed forever. Yeah. And when he said that in the interview, with, not in the film, but in the interview, I knew it was in the film. Like, I mean, that, that's, and he's so stoic the way he says it. And it's just like, it's like the, the nail on the coffin of that sequence of the film leading up to kind of like the cherry on the cake of for game one. And I, so I really knew even before filming uh and making the film or as i got into into the production of the film i knew that game one and game eight would be really dramatized and 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 i would really give it give it a lot because there's so much build up to it you know what i mean and so less for the other games but one and eight and i'd say four as well with vancouver with the esposito speech so you have like a nice bridge there but all the games are part are part of the film and i really did want viewers especially younger viewers and 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 even for myself i hadn't seen all of this all of it you know so i really did want the hockey games the on ice drama to to be alive and and well portrayed in the film especially games one and eight and that's what that's that's the result and and i know it's it really works because you you get into it so much at the beginning of the film because of game one and then at the end the last 15 minutes of the film all about game eight and all the drama before the puck even drops you know the, the who's gonna ref and eagleson running out on the ice and uh, all the fighting and stuff i mean it's just it's you can't script that stuff i mean you just no. <laughs> it's, well, it's quite it's, something it's almost you know all the games in themselves specifically you know i think you mentioned one four and eight they're all films in their own right so i think you did such a good job of abridging in the film itself of telling the story and then abridging the stories before and after kind of like how you would have a normal game that you'd watch in hockey night in Canada, right. Of having the after and talking about, Hey, what happened in this game? It was like the nice little commentary of this is what happened. And 
where the mindset was for both teams going to the next game. It was a really nice bridge to everything to interconnect to each other. Yeah. And, and I was able to, I was able to also maintain a lot of the characters in mm -hmm. the film right through the whole film. So you have everybody like still chiming in the sequencing and, you know, Katie Hines, the blonde haired fan from Montreal. She's, she's there throughout the film. You know, Terry Moshe is there throughout the film. Gary's there. Alan Eagleson is there. Conacher's there. Gretzky's there. So I mean, and the Russians, Trechak is there throughout the film. And, and they're all like, how should I say, active participants telling the story, bouncing yeah. off each other, each, you know, pushing the narrative forward. So uh, I'm really pleased that, that, you know, that I was able to do that. And I did know that I wanted everybody to be like deconstructing game eight and game one, you know, and so there, everyone's commenting on it, and it fr from their own perspective. You know, Eagleson as the general manager, you know, Gary Smith as the diplomat and as the liaison for, for the, the Soviet team, you know, Conacher as the sidekick to, to Foster Hewitt. And let me just say one other thing, I mean, which is really important. I knew that there was going to be the, the CBC series with Dryden. And we had an agreement, basically a, a non-verbal agreement, a, a verbal agreement, you know, that the players were, were their story. And it was a blessing for me because I, I, I felt that the player's story had already been told many times in books and in previous productions and that you know it, it remains the player's level and i wanted to, to take the story up to, to a much bigger level a wider level a bigger tent bringing in other voices all people that were intimately involved with 72 either impacted by it or directly involved protagonists so, so that was a that was a blessing in a sense that they were doing their project and they said the players are are are, are exclusive to, to my project and I said that's great because we're gonna we're gonna use some of them in uh, in archive and uh, we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna run with this uh, in another direction and that's what Icebreaker is. And I, I thought it was so important too to have someone like Gretzky in it. Ron McLean was crucial too, but Wayne kind of just being the void, like you know the greatest athlete for some Canadians, right? To to have his view as a child growing up watching that and how important he is to Canada going forward, it meant so much for me just to kind of hear what Wayne's thought was. And he was so elegant about talking about everything. Mm -hmm. Elegant and, and eloquent and, yeah. and, and articulate. It just, it was amazing. And, you know, that was before the war in the Ukraine. And, and that, that bit about him, you know, watching with his grandfather, he's an 11 year old and his grandfather yeah, comes from that was the mint. huge. And his grandfather's listening to Trechek talk to Johnny Esai in between the periods in game two. And his grandfather has tears in his eyes. And because he, he was understanding what the Russian was saying and Gretzky sitting there as an 11, 12 year old. And he, he realizes like actually it dawns on him where his, where his, where his roots are, where his grandfather comes from, uh, that he could understand. And then, you know, he, 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 he sums it up in the most beautiful way, telling us like, well, what would have happened, you know, if, if uh, you know, my, my father had migrated to Winnipeg to work on the railways, you know, he actually marries a Ukrainian in Winnipeg. Yeah. So Gretzky says, I'm Russian Ukrainian. I mean, how beautiful is that? I mean, as you know, the, the war going on right now, I mean, for him, Gretzky to be saying, you know, it just shows how we're all immigrants, right? And how we all come yeah. from all over the world. And it's, it's, it's like, it's a shared planet. And here Gretzky is like saying that he's got Russian Ukrainian roots. Uh, I mean, how beautiful can that be? And then he, he, he tops it off by saying, wouldn't have been crazy if, if he had never migrated to Canada. I, I probably would have been playing with Fetisov and Lariana against Canada. You know, yeah. how crazy is that? You know, so that, that, that's just a golden moment. You know, another golden moment from Gretzky. It kind of boggled your mind. It's like, oh, what? <laughs> this is a weird what a moment I don't want to think about as a Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, exactly. But I mean, it's just goes to show you like the, the, you know, the scattering of seeds. You know, it's like... Uh, you know, my our parents, my my parents came, from, grandparents came from from Eastern Europe as well. So it's just like, what happens? You know, and our our parents were born, my parents were born in Canada, but they, they met, and you know, it's all this destiny. You know, in a sense, and and Gretzky brings it to, to the screen right there. Wayne ninety nine, the legend, telling us that he could have been with you know with the Russians playing playing against Canada. That's quite something. It was. That's why I think it's such a crucial part to have Wayne part of that, the telling of it, and then. To, you know, leave a lot of people with that. What if? Uh, 
fast forward into game four now, I think the big thing out of game four is, and you hit the arc perfectly, number one, the Esposito speech, which I think a lot of Canadians do remember, but then also the booing and then Canada having their back with Canadians, you know, how passionate they are about hockey and booing them off. And then Esposito's speech as they are about to head to Europe. I think hitting those two marks and hitting the tone there was really crucial for the film to really let it be known. I've heard stories from my grandfather and my father about that time, but I thought you did such a good job of setting up what the feeling was like before they headed to the Soviet Union. Yeah, yeah. And, and no, I learned a lot too, actually, to be honest. I mean, I, I had never heard the speech. Uh, I had never experienced it until I started doing this film. And, you know, it's like you have Roy McGregor commenting on it and you have Gretzky commenting on it. And I had others as well, which I didn't include. I mean, there's a lot of material that, that doesn't end up in the film. But I knew I wanted a lot of people to comment on the Esposito speech. And, um, you know, Gretzky, again, so eloquent and so articulate saying, you know, it comes from the heart and you don't script something like that. I mean, the, the booing was not, you know, something that they expected, but it, it started right at, right at, as soon as they got on the ice, in fact. Uh, the, the Canadian fans, uh, fans in Vancouver were, were pissed off that we were behind in the series. And, and, it, and there was, uh, not everybody, it, it was a, trinkling, a sprinkling of booing, right, from, from up top. Uh, but it got progressively louder as the game went on because, you know, the Team Canada was really not playing. And uh, they were down 5-2, they lose 5-3. They were sitting on Tretiak, knocking people over, getting penalties. The Soviets ran away with the game. We looked really, like, exposed. Like, we looked really, like, when I say we, I'm talking about Team Canada, look really out of it and uh, not at, at the same level as the Soviets. So when Esposito comes to the microphone to do his speech, he's carrying all of this, all this drama inside him, all this pressure, all this tension. And him being the leader of the team, one of the unofficial captains of the team, he, uh, he just, you know, you can't script it. I mean, he, he, the button went on and he gives us this unbelievable speech. And what it did, what it did was it, it showed to Canadians, because a lot of people saw it, that the players really did care that they weren't just on some friendly exhibition or some holiday. That they, and they realized that they were playing for Canada and that they had a responsibility. And it, it, it's considered a turning point in the series, that loss and then the speech. And, the, and, and it's, it's sort of like it set the tone for what was to come. Uh, and they never looked back from that moment. You know, the players didn't really hear the speech. It was the fans that heard the speech, mm -hmm. right? And the media. Yeah, yeah the, the, the player, you know, there's no internet, there's no, there's no Instagram or Facebook or social media. I mean, they never heard the speech until maybe years later, you know what I mean? So, but Esto said to the players, I gave this really big speech to, to CTV, CBC, and uh, he probably explained to the guys. But what happened is that you got all these telegrams and all these messages coming from across Canada to the players. When they arrived in Moscow, there were 10,000 messages, telegrams letters, postcards, saying, go Canada, we're behind you, we believe in you. And there was a, like a shift. I think, you know, the, the Montreal was a shock, a complete shock, changed, you know, changed hockey forever. Toronto was like, everything's better in the world because they win four to one. Yeah. Then they, they blew a lead in, the, in, in, in Winnipeg. Uh, and now the series is one win, one tie, one loss. And then you go into Vancouver and you say, okay, we're going to win Vancouver and like, you know, before we go to Russia, we're going to be feeling okay about ourselves. And it's the opposite. It's a disaster. So the table really was set for that speech and he delivered it without even probably thinking he was going to sit, do it. You know, it just, it just came out that way. And it, wow. Very impressive. He really stands out as the main character in this for Canada at the very least, just between, you know, but the shenanigans of game one with the face off the speech and then even you know coming out for the introduction and falling down yeah uh but then just handling it so perfectly which a lot of people you know wouldn't be able to handle it perfectly but i think from he that did. grace he had there he was able to handle it so well and then talking about in game eight like i just want to win i, I think that arc for esposito was told yeah. so perfectly yeah no exactly and it's fun it's great because i i mean i obviously appreciate your uh your interpretation of things, because I see you really watch the film, <laughs> yeah. you know, and you understand the film and you, you just see his his narrative line that, yeah. from that face off, you know, to the speech, 
And there's another section where we, where we, uh, all this black and white footage that I found in, 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 in Russia, these archives, that was shot by Russia. I, I found that so profound uh, with, with all that. And then you come into game eight and I, I, I liked, you know, it wasn't like a yada, 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 but it was like, hey, Canada, they've started to find their mojo and now we're heading into game eight. And I, and I, the one thing I really loved too, Robbie, was you teased the Paul Henderson thing before it happened, right? Like Paul was really finding his stride. He was really getting going before getting into then the goal happens. But about 10 minutes before it happens, mm -hmm. you everyone kind of talk about how Paul was finding his way in the series. And I thought that was a real key thing to do. Of Because some documentaries would be, oh yeah, Paul Henderson was great and then he got the goal. You guys had that arc where it's like, hey, he was starting to find himself. And then 10 yeah. minutes later, then we showcase off the goal that's remembered. Exactly. And we break it down to the, we break it down with, you know, he's not on the ice. Two minutes to go. That was crazy. Yeah, I know. Isn't that crazy? Me. Great huddle, great huddle uh, with five Montreal Canadiens, four Montreal Canadians and Phil Esposito. You have Savard, Lapointe, Cornway, and Mahovlich, and Esposito. This is like Sindon saying, okay, these are the guys. This is how it's going to come down. And this is who I trust. You know, and it's so crazy. And then what's his name? Henderson's on the bench, but he has a premonition. He's going to, he's, it's, it, he's got to get on. He yeah. scored the winner in game six and in game seven. Right? So he says, it's destiny. I've got to get on the ice. And what happens? Peter, Peter. I mean, players don't know to call on other players yeah. like that. They call them and Peter gets off and he jumps on. There's only a minute left. I mean, I'm almost talking like what you hear in the film, but that's exactly yeah. how it is. And that's, I mean, I, I didn't know that either. And these are all things I discovered when I started reading the manuscripts and the books and stuff and realizing all these, all these incredible stories and the story, of course, of the referees, the game didn't almost happen. Yeah. You know, well, and they, attacking they, the one ref, that pitcher, as much as we look, we, you know, we go to the lower of that Paul Henderson pitcher, the one with the stick up about the deck, the ref was fantastic. And it showed yeah, how important that series was to everyone and the frustration that was building with the officials. Oh yeah, no, it's it's an incredible photo. I mean, it's it's right there, split second before yeah. the stick comes down. I mean, obviously he didn't go through with it. He was just so frustrated. But the whole day before, with Gary Smith and and Sinden and Eagleson negotiating with with the Soviets and the KGB officers in a hotel room. You know, we not the West German. We want the the Swede, not yeah. the Swede. And then the next morning, the Swede is, suddenly says, "We chose the Swede. They chose the Czech, the West German, but the Swede can't do it." because he's not feeling well, you know, the Eagles and I just had breakfast with him. He seemed in good shape to me, you know? And yeah. so it's, it, it, it's great stuff. And then of course it's all this controversy and the number of penalties that had been called against in Canada was, was, was really uh, actually unbalanced uh, overall. When you look at like the penalty minutes in the series in the Moscow games and uh, the game begins and it's just like, there's all this hype and drama before the, even the pucks drops. And then you have Jean-Paul Parisi getting ex expelled out of the game. Then you have the chairs being thrown on the ice. Then you have all hell breaks loose. Then you have when Cornway scores the goal, the fifth goal to tie, to tie, the, to tie it up, uh, they, the goal judge doesn't put on the light. You know, and, then Hender, and then Eagleson goes berserk and charges. The ch I mean, you, you can't script this stuff. I mean, no. it's... it's it's unbelievable, and you, it, we've, it's all there. It's all on art and on archive, and it's just and to have you know Eagleson, who's eighty-eight years old, talking about that in such a dramatic and humorous way, and, and very well told, told. I mean, he, he, he's he's tremendous in the film. Uh, it's just, I mean, I, I mean, I couldn't believe I was hearing this stuff. You know, I mean, it's just this is just too good to be true, and uh, it all comes together. It really all builds into the drama of that game eight in the last 10 minutes of, 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 uh, of the series, in fact, you know? There's a story that's not in the film, but it's a great story I can share with you if you like. Sure, please. Yeah, uh, I mean, it has to do with game eight. The night before, they're, they're invited, I mean, all the off nights, they were invited to something cultural. Once was the a museum, once was the circus. On the night, on the eve of game eight, they're invited to the Bolshoi Ballet. The players don't really want to go. They go to these things because they're invited and they, they stay half the time. So at half time, and it's a famous play, uh, Anna Karenina and uh, the prima yeah. ballerina is like this uh, yeah. amazing you know, dancer. And everybody gets up and gives, gives them an applause at half time at the intermission. 
Phil Esposito is standing like in the first row. He doesn't get, he doesn't sit down. He keeps clapping like this, giving, giving the prima ballerina. So she keeps bowing and he keeps clapping and everybody has stopped clapping and it's just him. So she's like, who is this guy? <laughs> who is this guy? So it ends, they leave. The next day, she shows up at the game. She wants to see the game. And after two periods, after two periods, she goes down to the Canadian locker room and says, I want to speak to a Phil Esposito. And she's, got, she's escorted by a KGB officer. They knock on the door and Phil Esposito comes to the door. And she, she says, you were so generous to, to give me that applause uh, last night uh, at, half, at the halfway point of the, of the ballet that I want to wish you good luck for the third period. So what happens next? He comes out and he scores the goal, right? She yeah. was criticized, ostracized by the cultural mm -hmm. community in, 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 in Russia and in Moscow for having, like they say, it's her fault that they, you know, some oh. people blamed her. But it's an untold story uh, of what took place between wow. this ballerina and Esposito and how she came to the, uh, to the Canadian locker uh, before the third period to wish him good luck. Uh, quite a story. Just the respect on both sides given. So interesting. Yeah, completely. Completely. Uh, a few last questions here. And again, Robbie, thanks for your time on this brilliant film. Uh, the, te the television side was so, you know, you didn't get into it as much, but the stuff you did was great of talking about the Super Bowl level commercial that they were getting and how much more the ratings jumped up just for the international game. The one thing I was curious about, and if it was in the film, forgive me if I missed it, but so we know for the Miracle on Ice, that was TV delayed, even though it was in the States, it was TV delayed mm -hmm. by six hours or so. So you didn't have social media. So it was a little bit harder to know the result, but some news outlets let out the results and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. These, these were all live for Canadians, every single one of these yeah. games. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's why kids were in school because it was taking place at night in Moscow. Yeah. Right. It was around three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, it was an eight o'clock or nine o'clock game. So it was later in the day. I mean, in the evening in Moscow. Yeah, it, it was. And, and it, it's crazy. That whole mystery, like the signal was coming from the moon and, the yeah. screen is sketchy and you know it's like the signal would be breaking up and i mean you know it's all part of that the, the mystique and the, the drama of, of of 16 million canadians i mean it's still today a record a broadcast canadian record 16 million people watching one single event wow. uh, nothing has ever come close to it nothing will nothing ever will no i mean we're too yeah. fragmented now yeah uh, to, for that to actually happen but uh, it's a singular moment. It's kind of like, you know, Neil Armstrong, like landing on the moon type of thing, you know yeah. what I mean? and putting down the flag. Like everybody kind of knows where they were, or like when John Lennon was shot. But I mean, those are like one moment. I, you know, the Summit Series was a month, it was 27 days. So you were like enthralled, captivated, you know, from September 1 to September 28. So it, it, it's not like this John F. Kennedy gets shot and like, where were you type of thing? You know what yeah. I mean? It's, it's this uh, long river that you've been on now and you're completely emotionally invested. Uh, and, and, and it's been going on for 27 days. And here you are now at, at the peak of this game eight. And it's just, it just built up and built up. It kept building. I mean, and, and as, as we uh, described in the film, I mean, Ron Bremner, who is the advertising agent, mandated to, to provide um, rates for the, uh, for the agencies or for the uh, corporate sponsors. And they thought he was, you know, he says smoking. I didn't know what that meant when he said it. Smoking, smoking the drapes, you know, but it means smoking yeah. pot. Yeah. yeah, it means smoking, but I think I'm smoking like I'm crazy. Like well, I'm yeah. charging fifteen thousand dollars at for thirty seconds when the highest thing ever was two thousand dollars. Crazy. Well I'm telling you there's gonna be eight million people, you know, watching this. So um, no it was I mean it's phen it's phenomenal. And you just see those scenes in the archives of people in bars screaming it up and down. Yeah. And, you know, everybody's just like Mike Keenan saying he you know he didn't have a TV so he was standing on Young Street, you know, <laughs> looking at looking into a window where there where there was uh, you know TVs on and everybody was watching it. So Quite the story, eh? I thought that was too the the best part about the cartoon is too was showing the Canadian fans that were in the yes. stands, but the, yes. the the drawings of it. Yes, you can see the visual of it, right? But the popping color 
of the Canadian fans and then the brown and the grays of the Soviet fans. That I thought, that's why the uh, bringing in the artist, I thought was such a brilliant touch because you can show that stuff. You're like, yeah, the Canadians fans are there. It was great. That was really like an exclamation point of like, no, this is what it was really like. Yeah. You know, Josh, you're, you're hitting it on the nose. I mean, those drawings were all exclamation points in a sense. Yeah. You know, you have the one where they're, where they're retreating from Moscow after losing game five. You know, this you see, yeah. you see a red square behind them and the Canadians are all bandaged up on crutches. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it ends that note, that, that moment of game five, you know what I mean? Where we lost when we should have won type of thing. Or like the one in the bar in Montreal with fans like this all pissed off, like, because the Soviets are running away with it. Or like the one with the fans. I mean, it, it's just, you know, or the one when he says, when we arrived in Moscow, we're running around the streets, you know, with all these drunken Canadians with horns and flags. And, you know, and you, see, you see this drawing of this Canadian <laughs> Go Canada. It's next to a statue of Lenin. You know what I mean? So they're really used. Those drawings are really used in a really satirical, humorous way. And they really get good reactions from the audience. And as you say, they're, they're, they're exclamation points, you know. And, and the one about the fans, I mean, that whole scene has a big buildup to it. You know, how yeah. the fans were completely uh you know i mean amazing i mean the the the, the dichotomy between the 3000 canadians and the 9000 soviets and how we were out screaming them and uh, how they were like two worlds apart you know it really was like communism and 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 freedom of speech you know because you could soviets are all like this and the canadians are just you know. <laughs> yeah yeah that was probably really well too uh my, my last question is so you know you've kind of guys have been out on the circuit now doing the festivals how have has the film been received and have you got everything out of it that you wanted to? Yeah, to be honest, I mean, Josh, these types of conversations I'm having with you, I've had with uh, several people now, maybe not as lengthy as this one, but yeah. I'm really, really appreciative of the, the response the film's getting. I, I mean, media is one thing and then the audience is another. I mean, from the audience perspective, as I was saying, when you're in a room with 300 people, 200 people, even 55 people, you could feel the energy in the room. People are invested in the story from the beginning to the end. No one is, no one is like, uh, what am I doing here? Everybody's like, and the comments I'm getting after the films and the Q and A's, I mean, you can tell when it, when an audience is engaged because the room has an energy to it. And there's a lot of laughter in this film. There's a lot of humor. You know, there's a lot of like crazy moments and you, you just, you just feel it. And you know, the audience, when, when, when Eagleson gets, um, gets liberated from the clutches of the Soviet authorities. People yeah. like people have stand stood up cheering, you know what I mean? In the audience. And like there's there's moments of like cheering and rooting and and goosebumps and laughter. So I, I really do feel that the, that icebreaker has achieved uh, my my dreams, my visions for for making uh reliving 72 50 years later and bringing it to an audience and making it like a discovery, you know. Roy McGregor says it so well because he knows the story so well and he knows what happened and he's written books on it and such. And he, he watches the film before it was released and he says, this is like I've, like I've rediscovered 72. Like, like you brought, it's 72 2.0. Yeah. It's like a whole new uh, way of seeing it, a whole new way of looking at it. And a lot of people are saying to me that, that we have to organize a screening for the players. That the players have to see Icebreaker. Because this is, this is a whole bigger, broader, more layered um story about what they went through uh and uh it's they're saying it's a must do so you know from the media perspective the coverage is really getting good uh toronto is going to be huge on the 28th uh i think the, the cinema is almost sold out uh and uh, a lot of the uh participants are going to be there brian conacher ron mcclain is coming uh, bob lewis is going to be there gary smith is going to be there uh, and it's it's going to be a really good energy in the room uh, with with all these people there, and uh, you know a Toronto crowd, and um, it's the 28th as well, you know, 50 years to the day. Well, thanks so much for being a part of this interview. I, as you can probably tell, I really did enjoy the film, and I, I thought you guys like you, you did a terrific job of telling the story. Obviously, I think there's a generational gap that was missed for where everything lines up, and I think you guys hit everything right on the head so really well done and, and thank you so much for your time no oh, excellent josh i really appreciate your uh, your your insights and analysis and appreciation of the films i could tell that you really watched it and you really got into it and uh 
and it's not just like you're doing homework like you actually experienced it you know what i mean yeah so cool thanks again robbie Thank until you. next time folks yeah. cheers and enjoy the game people. you're listening to the fresh take network sip interview exclusive